As we begin here this morning, I want to ask you a question that I would love for you to consider with me. And the question that I want to ask you and would encourage you to even think through is what do you want to see God do? What do you here this morning dream of or pray about that you really want to see God do this? What is the this that you would fill in the blank with? And as you consider that question, I want to invite you to grab your Bible and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Before we even get to our text that we're going to study here today, I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 3 because I need you to see four foundational truths about God and what he is able to do. Look at Ephesians 3 verse 20. It says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. As we begin here this morning, from this passage, I want to give you four foundational truths about God, who he is, and what he is able to to do. If you got a handout here this morning, you could open it up and you could write these things down on your handout or wherever you're taking notes. But here's truth number one. God is able to do more than you think. Truth number one, God is able to do more than you think. And even that, what I'm telling you to write down here this morning is a simplified way of saying it. Because verse 20 literally says that God is able to do far more abundantly. So like whatever you think God can do or whatever you ask God can do, the Bible is telling us here this morning, he can do far more. He can do far more abundantly than what you could ask or think God is able to do. Here's truth number two. God has given his people his power to accomplish his work. God has given his people his power so that way they can accomplish his work. What the Bible teaches us is that God accomplishes his work, what he wants to do through his people. He has given them his power. It's at work within us. And now what he wants to do is he wants to use us to do things for him And here's truth number three, the reason why is because God primarily accomplishes his work through his church for the glory of Jesus. You have to understand that here this morning. God primarily accomplishes his work, what he is doing through his church, through his people. And the reason why, all of why he does this is for the glory of Jesus. Jesus, to lift high the name of his son, so that way he will get all of the glory. This is why God does what he does, because he's worthy. He's deserving of all glory. And so the reason why he gives his people his power so they can accomplish his work is so that way when that happens, he'll get all the glory. And this takes us to truth number four, God's power has not diminished as time has gone on. See, as time has gone on from when the Bible was written, God's power that he was using at work during the time of the Bible has not gotten any less. God has not gotten weaker as time has gone on. This verse tells us it's throughout all generations, forever and ever. So I believe that God did great things in the time of Jesus. Do you believe that here this morning? I believe that God did great things in the early church. Do you believe that here this morning? I believe that even when you look at history and you look at the church throughout history, that God has proven himself able to do great things. You could study revivals. You could study awakenings. So I believe that our God has done great things throughout church history. And I'm here to say this morning that I believe our God can do far more abundantly today in our time. And the reason why is because our God stays the same. He does not change The power that he was using to work in times past 
has not gotten any less. It has not diminished. He has not gotten weaker. He stays the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so it's with these four truths in mind that I want to bring that question back up, and I want to ask you, what do you want to see God do? And I actually have a follow-up question to that question, and it's this. If all of these things are true, are you seeing God work through you? If these four truths are true, are you seeing God work through you? And if God's not working through you, if you can't look at your life, if you can't look at the past year and see any ways that God has accomplished His work through you for the glory of Jesus, I believe there are three options why, and I want to give them to you real quick. Option number one, you could write it down in your handout like this. Let's call it sitting on the bench. You could write down sitting on the bench. And here's what I mean by that, and some of you guys know exactly what I mean by that because you play sports and you know sitting on the bench real well. What I mean is you're sitting on the bench. You're not evangelizing. You're not praying Maybe you would say here this morning that you believe God can do great things, but you're not serving him in any way. You're not trying to do great things for God. Yeah, you would say here on a Sunday morning at church after we sing the worship songs and after we look at Ephesians chapter 3, I believe God can do a great work, but yet at the same time with the way that you're living, you're not trying to do any kind of great work for God. You're sitting on the bench. Here's option number two. You could write this down on your handout. Behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. And what I mean by that is, well, God is at work, but right now he's at work behind the scenes. You just can't see it yet. At Band of Brothers, for all my brothers who are there, you know what I'm about to say. For the gospel girls here in the room, You have no idea what I'm about to say, so let me bring you in. At Band of Brothers, each time that we gather this school year, we're going to hear from a senior. A senior is going to share about a trial or some kind of thing that they've gone through that God has actually used to grow them in their relationship with him, to make them more spiritually mature. And this past Thursday at Band of Brothers, we heard a very encouraging story. I'm going to now start referring to all the guys here at United as brother and then whatever their name is. We heard a very encouraging story from brother Joey. Brother, you can refer to him as brother Yosef Mew if you would like to, since that is his surname on Instagram. And he shared of a season in his life where he felt like he was working hard for the Lord. But even though he felt like he was working hard for the Lord, he really felt like God was not working. Like here he is trying to do all these great things, evangelize, pray, lead this Christian club. And he's like, I don't feel like anybody's coming to church. I don't feel like anybody's getting saved. It just feels like all of the things that I'm doing, nothing seems to be happening from it. And he shared with us on Thursday night that he's able to look back now on that season, that difficulty that he went through, and he can see, hey, God brought me through that to actually teach me steadfastness, to help me persevere and learn how to keep on going when it feels tough because even when he looks back on that season he can now see during that time that God saved at his school two different guys that he didn't even know about during that time where he felt like he was doing so much for the Lord and it felt like the Lord wasn't doing so much at the same exact time see that's this idea of behind the scenes you're working and God is working you just can't see it yet But then option number three, you could write it down like this on your handout. We'll call it user error. User error. You believe God can work. You even want to see God work. You might even say that you are trying to work for God, but you've got some user error. You're working wrongly. And it's with that introduction, I want to show you one of the potential user errors that we have here at United. So grab your Bible with me and turn to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, this is going to be our text here this morning, and it is a sad comparison to what we studied last week. If you were here last week, we went up the mountain and we had a powerful experience with Jesus and the transfiguration. 
We saw Jesus transfigured right before our eyes in all of his glorious righteousness. His face was shining. His clothes were white. It was a powerful mountaintop experience. And our text, the next one in Matthew, is going to show us how most Christians live when they come down from the mountain. And it's a sad comparison. Because this is our passage, I'm going to invite everybody to stand up this morning for the public reading of God's Word. Follow along as I read Matthew 17, beginning in verse 14. It says this in Matthew 17, verse 14, And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before Jesus said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and they said, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. That's the reading of God's word. You can go ahead and have your seat here this morning. What we just read is an example in the scripture of something good, something that needs to happen that almost doesn't. And the reason why is because this is user error on behalf of the disciples. And what's the problem? Jesus says, he makes it so clear, it's the thrust of our passage that we're studying here this morning, they have little faith. Now let me make it very clear to everybody here this morning, little faith does not limit what God can do. And we need to understand that. But little faith does limit what we can do for God. Okay, we need to develop a category of thinking in our minds that goes something like this. There are good things that God can do that he has chosen not to because he works through men and men often have user error in their working for him. Okay, that's a hard concept for you to understand or wrap your mind around here this morning, and maybe you feel like you never heard something like that. Let me give you a couple of verses that you could jot down on your handout that really prove this point that we're seeing here in the scripture. James chapter 4, verse 2 is the first one that we'll throw up on the screen. It says, you do not have because you do not ask. Here's a passage that's talking about prayer, and what is it saying? There are things that you could have in your life right now that you do not have, and what is the reason? It's not because God does not want to give them. It's not because God is not able to give them. The reason why is because you are not asking God to give them. And then there's this passage, Ezekiel 22, verses 30 and 31, which is such a powerful text. Because God is speaking to the people that he's about to judge, and he's telling them why he's going to judge them. And he says this, And I sought for a man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Here's God speaking to people that he's about to judge. And he's saying, hey, I was looking among the people because I did not want to judge. And what was I looking for? I was looking for any man. I was looking for one person who would build up the wall, who would stand. He says, stand in the breach before me. This is a picture of a man going before God in prayer on behalf of of people in sin and asking for forgiveness, God says, I just looked for one guy who was doing something like that. So therefore, I would forgive and I wouldn't judge. And because I found none, therefore, I have poured out my wrath. Therefore, I have brought my indignation, my anger, my judgment, and poured out my justice on you because no one was praying and asking for forgiveness. Here's an example where God is saying, I didn't want to judge. I was looking for ways not to judge, but because I found no person who was praying to me on behalf of the other people, I will judge. I want to show you in our passage here this morning because of the disciples' little faith, 
Jesus is disappointed in his disciples. Look at verse 16. Verse 16, here comes the father of this son who is demon-possessed and is having these seizures. And the father says to Jesus, I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered in verse 17, specifically to the disciples, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? I mean, when you look at those two rhetorical questions, can you not just hear the disappointment in his voice? Here comes the father with his, his request, his, his plea for mercy on his son. It's just a dad who loves his boy that is looking for help, and he brings him to the disciples, and the disciples cannot heal him. And so then Jesus, Peter, James, and John, they come down off the mountain, and they see this commotion, and Jesus is like, what's going on? And the dad says to Jesus, I brought my boy to your disciples. Your disciples could not heal him. And so how does Jesus respond? Does he respond with like sympathy and understanding and like, oh, disciples, I get it. This would be a hard one. Oh, disciples, I get it. Man, no biggie. I got this one. No, he responds and you can clearly feel and you can hear the disappointment. How long am I going to be with you guys before you get it? How long do I need to keep on being patient and bearing with you until you live the way that I'm instructing you to live. And let me show you why Jesus is disappointed in his disciples. Turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 10. Just a couple pages to the left. Matthew chapter 10, and look at verse 1. This is something we've already studied, but let's just review it here this morning for a minute. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, says that Jesus called to him his 12 disciples, and he gave to them, he gave to his disciples the authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. So did the disciples have the ability? Did the disciples have the power? Did the disciples have the authority to cast out demons? Yes, they did. Did the disciples have the authority to heal every disease and every affliction? Yes, they did. Why? Because Jesus had already given it to them. In Matthew chapter 10, seven chapters before what we're studying here this morning. And so Jesus is disappointed, and the reason why he's disappointed is because his disciples had the power to perform this miracle. His disciples had the ability to heal this boy. They were able, but the text tells us two different times that we're studying here this morning, they could not. They had the power but when they went to go do the miracle or when they went to heal the boy, they were not successful. And the reason why is because they had little faith. Their faith limited what they were able to do. And man, as I stand before you guys here this morning, I do not want that to be the case with me. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I think about all that Christ has done to save me and make me his disciple and the things that he's enabled me to do, I don't want what I do for him to be limited in any way because of my lack of faith or my little faith in him and what he's already done to enable me to serve him. Man, I don't want that to be the case. Do you want that to be the case for you? I want to give you five disciplines here this morning to help you grow in your faith. You could write them down on your handout as we go. And here's discipline number one. I want to encourage you to focus on truth. You could write that down. Focus on truth. And the truth of the morning is that the disciples had the power because Christ had already given it to them. But the problem was is they weren't focused on that truth. See, that's, that's the problem. And I don't know what they were focused on. Maybe they were focused on how powerful the demon was. And so they were just overwhelmed and they were thinking about how powerful the demon was. And instead of having faith in God, they were thinking about the demon. I don't know. Maybe they were wondering where Christ was. Because Jesus went up on this mountain with Peter, James, and John. And he left the rest of the disciples down on the bottom of the mountain to continue doing the work while he was up on the top of the mountain. I don't know what they were focused on because the text doesn't tell us, but it's clear they weren't focused on the truth. They weren't focused on what was already true of them because of what Christ had done for them. Go back with me to Matthew chapter 17. 
And I want you to look at how Jesus answers the man in verse 17, because he says two things about his disciples that we need to understand here this morning. In Matthew 17, verse 17, when he's answering this father, he says to his disciples this, O faithless and twisted generation. And we understand what that word faithless means. It literally just means to have less faith than you should have. Faith less, less faith. We get that. We understand that. But then when he says twisted, what, is, what does that mean? Why is he calling his disciples twisted? Well, we'll throw up the word here on the screen. The Greek word that Jesus says is diastrepho. And what that word literally means, here's the definition, it means to turn aside to turn away. The idea of this word is God has straight up told you what you should do. God has straight up given his instructions for you. God has made his paths very straight for your life. It's clear who you are, where you should go, and what you should do. And diastrepho means that you just turn aside from it a little bit. You just turn away from it a little bit. This word diastrepho, it's used in Acts chapter 13 two different times, and we'll throw up this encounter on the screen. In Acts 13, verse 8, there's this guy named Elimus who's a magician, and he's an opponent of the disciples and the faith of Jesus Christ. And it says this, but Elimus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the pro council away from the faith. So Elimus, that word turn, this is the word diastrepho. He's looking at the disciples and all of the people that they're evangelizing and are being saved, and Elimus is trying to come over here and whisper in their ear, so to speak, and get them to turn away from these new straight paths that are being laid for them as they're now following the Lord. So Elimus is diastrephoing. He's trying to turn away the disciples from where they're supposed to go. And then here's what happens. We'll throw up the next verses, Acts 13, 9 and 10. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, he looked intently at Elimus and he said, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, Full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Will you not stop diastrephoing the straight paths of the Lord? Here's Saul's response to Elimus. Elimus is trying to turn away the disciples, and Saul shows up on the scene, and I just love how intense Saul can be. He's just like, you son of the devil. Could you imagine if I said that? I mean, some of you guys already think I'm intense just because of my passion and my energy. Could you imagine if I started saying something like things like that? Show up on Sunday at United. Hey, you guys weren't really singing this morning. You sons of the devil. Like, none of you guys would come back. You'd be like, that guy is crazy. This guy says that to Elimus' face. Hey, Elimus, I'm on to you. I know what you're doing is what Saul says. God has laid straight paths for his people, and you're trying to turn them aside. Stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord. That's the idea of this word. And this is so helpful for us because what Jesus is saying is that the disciples' faithlessness comes from their twistedness. See, the reason why they were faithless is because they were twisted. Jesus, I mean, the way that you could think about it is Jesus had straight up told them what they can do. We saw that in Matthew chapter 10. And here they are, they've turned aside from it. See, it's not that they didn't know. It's not that they had never heard. It's not that they did not understand. They knew that they had the power and the ability from Christ to heal people and cast out demons. The problem is they were not focused on what they knew. And they should have known that our God is a God who is able to move mountains. They should have known that our God, there is no obstacle that is too difficult for him to to remove. Our God is able to move whatever stands in the way. And the reason why they should have known is because that's what the Bible's been telling us all along. Let me show you some examples of this from prophecy. Isaiah 40 verse 4. We'll throw it up here on the screen. It says this, every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And that passage is specifically referring to what the Messiah is able to do when he comes, when the Christ comes. And we know who he is. He is Jesus. He is our savior. When he comes, he's going to be 
able to take valleys and lift them up. He's going to be able to take mountains and hills and make them low. Isaiah 49, verse 11 says it like this, And I will make all my mountains a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Prophets of old have told us of what our God can do. He's able to move mountains. There is nothing too difficult for the Lord. And moving mountains is not only something that the disciples should have known that they can do. Moving mountains is something I need to make sure you know that you can do. Go with me in your Bibles to Matthew 21. Everybody, turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 21 here this morning and look at what happens in verse 18. This is honestly kind of a, it, it, it's like a funny story the first time that you read it and you understand what's going on. Matthew 21, look at verse 18. It says, in the morning, as Jesus was returning to the city, he became hungry, which we can all understand being hungry in the morning. Some of you guys are like, I'm there right here, right now. I get you, Jesus. I feel you. And seeing a fig tree, Jesus sees a fig tree by the wayside while he's hungry. He went to it because he's hungry and he wants to get some figgy snacks and he found nothing on it, but only leaves. And he said to the fig tree, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled. And they said, how, how did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and you do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. This story right here is an example. And maybe something you've felt before. I definitely know that I've felt it before. This is an example of Jesus getting hangry. Have you ever been there? Where you're so hungry that you start to get angry? The rumblies in your tumblies start making you irritable? And people are getting on your nerves. And here Jesus is. He's hungry. And he sees off in the distance a fig tree. And he wants to go get a fig newton bar off that tree. And so he walks up to the fig tree. And guess what he finds on that fig tree? No figs. And he's upset. He's frustrated. And so he says to the fig tree, may no fruit ever come from you again. He just starts speaking to trees, and the tree just withers at once. And the disciples see it, and they're marveling. They're in awe. They're like, what? Did, did, you, did you just see what just happened? Are you serious? And Jesus takes this powerful moment as a teaching point, and he says to them, hey, you think that was amazing? If you have faith, not only will you be able to do that, but you'll be able to say to mountains, be moved into the sea. I don't know what your mountain is here this morning. Maybe you've got something in your life that you want to see God do, and it feels like a mountain because it feels like, man, I just don't know. How is something like that going to happen? Maybe you've got a specific person in mind that you want to see get saved, that you're just having a real hard time believing that God can do. A family member that's always been against the Lord has made fun of you because of your faith in Christ. Or a friend that you've invited to church so many times and you shared your testimony and you shared the gospel with them, but they always just don't seem to care. Or maybe you here this morning, it's not just like a specific person, you've got a whole group of people, maybe at your school, or maybe it's even your old friend group that you used to roll with before you got saved, and now you're plugged into the church, but man, you still love them, and you want to see them get saved, but because you've been saved, they've never come along with you, and you want to see them get saved, and you're wondering, man, honestly, like, God, can you really do that? Like, I want to see you do that. I pray for you to do that. But like, I just don't know if you, ah, that's hard for me to really believe. It's hard for me to really wrap my mind around. And what you're doing in that moment is you're looking at your mountain and you're thinking about how big the mountain is. That person getting saved, I don't know. Could someone like that ever get saved? This whole group of people being saved, I don't know. I, uh, that just seems hard for me to wrap my mind around. And what you're doing in that mountain, in that moment, is you're looking at your mountain and you're sizing it up, thinking about, focusing on how big it is. And I'm here to encourage you this morning, stop looking at how big your mountain is and start considering how big your God is. See, the reason why you can move mountains is not because of your faith. That's not the reason why. The reason why is because of who your faith 
is in. That's the reason why. Because our God is able to move any mountain. We teach our kids this song. We sing it all the time at our house. It's a fun song that we like to sing. Maybe some of you guys have heard it before because it's kind of like a children's nursery song. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing that my God can't do. Has anybody ever heard that song before? We love it at our house because it's so fun because after you sing that line, you go bump, bump, and then you sing that line again, but you sing it faster, and then you say bump, bump, and then you sing it faster, and it just gets so crazy in our house. My God is, you guys want to sing with me here this morning? You want to have a little fun, get interactive on a Sunday morning? Because the Saturday night crowd was not about this moment. So let's see if I can get you in on the Sunday morning because the Saturday night dumb chills ain't stopping me on Sunday morning, apparently. My, so how about we do this, all right? Let's just all sing it, okay? All together and get faster and faster every single time and have some fun. Like at my house, we really get into this. It turns into like a dance party. The kids start going crazy, but let's not turn into the dance party here this morning, okay? Let's just do the singing. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing that my God can't do. Bump, bump. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing that my God can't do. Bump, bump. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing that my God can't do. Bump, bump. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing that my God can't do. Bump, bump, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing that my God can't do. Bump, bump, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty. Yeah, okay, that's, that's all I got in me. I'm starting to lose my voice here this morning. Man, here's what I want to encourage you with here today. Can you focus on that truth? Like, like I, I, I get it. We got some big mountains, guys. I got some big mountains. I want to see God bring a revival to all the high schoolers here in Huntington Beach. I want to see God take public schools and turn them into private schools, if you know what I'm talking about. Because we see every single person on that campus get saved, and all of a sudden, you're now going to Marina Christian High School. I want to see God do something like that, and that is a big mountain. How in the world could God ever do something like that? And the problem is, is you're looking at the mountain. And I'm encouraging you here this morning from God's word, stop looking at how big your mountain is and start looking at how big your God is and just focus on that truth. This is discipline number two. You could write this down in your handout. Apply what you know. And I got to take a moment here this morning just to teach you guys for a second. Can I take a moment to teach you guys and go into kind of like professor instructor mode I got my cardigan on, my Christmas cardigan, so we'll go into teacher professor mode here for just a second. I got to teach you how to think about faith. Okay, there's two ways that you need to think about faith. There is saving faith, and then there is daily faith. Saving faith is when someone who is not a Christian at one time in their life places all of their faith and all of their trust and all of their confidence in the finished work of Jesus Christ that he died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the grave three days later. You put all of your faith in that for your salvation. That is saving faith. It happens at one time in one moment. But just because you are saved by faith, when you become a Christian, that does not mean you are done with faith. There is now daily faith. And daily faith is how you are supposed to live your life every day as a Christian. And what daily faith is, is when you wake up in the morning, you have a choice to make. How are you going to live your day? Are you going to be focused on your mountains and what you have going on in your life? Or are you going to choose to believe that God is able and you really actually live your life like you believe in that? That's daily faith. I'm choosing to believe in God. We have to understand something about faith here this morning. It is a choice. Every day when you wake up, you've got a choice to make. Even as a Christian, hey, am I going to be focused on myself? Am I going to be focused on what I've got going on? Or am I going to be focused on God, who he is and his word and what he's called me to do, and I'm going to put my faith and my trust and my belief in him. Faith is a choice that you have to make every single day. And yet at the same time, faith is also like something that we understand in our physical world with these human bodies. It's like a muscle. See, the more that you choose to go to the gym, the more that you choose to hit the weights 
and work out your muscles and strengthen your body, every time you make that choice, your muscles grow stronger and stronger. And the same thing is true with faith. It's a choice that you have to make every single day, but also at the same time, the more that you choose to put your faith in God, who he is and what he's able to do, the stronger and stronger your faith is going to grow. The more that you apply what you know. Go with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 4. I want to give you a great example of this. So everybody, turn with me to Romans chapter 4. And look at verse 18. This is going to tell us a little bit about the story of Abraham. Romans chapter 4, verse 18. It's referring to Abraham, and it says this, and I love just this line right here at the beginning of verse 18. In hope, he believed against hope. That's a great line right there. See, there was this time in Abraham's life where it felt like hope was lost. It felt like he had no reasons why he should have hope. And guess what Abraham did? In hope, he believed against hope. Like when it felt like hope was lost and there was no other reasons why he should have hope, guess what he did? In hope, he believed against that hope. That he should become, and here's specifically what he believed and had hope in, that he should become the father of many nations. And then look at these five words right here. Underline them, circle them, or write them down in your handout. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Abraham had some circumstances in his life where it would have been real easy for him to doubt. Okay, he was a hundred years old. His wife was not able to have kids, and yet he had a promise from God. God had told him something, and the specific promise that God had given him is that God was going to give him an offspring. God was going to give him a child. And if you're 100 years old and your wife is barren, that would have felt like a mountain. That would have been something that would have been very easy to look at the circumstances in your life and doubt and waver in your faith. But when he looked at his circumstances, he applied what he knew. He remembered what God had told him. See, despite the fact that he was 100 years old, he chose to believe in what God had promised. Despite the fact that his wife was unable to have kids, he chose to remember what God had told him. And this is the lesson for us here this morning. We need to apply what we know. Go back with me to Matthew chapter 17, and I don't know where you're at truly here in this room when it comes to your faith. I know that we've got some people here in the room this morning, and you're brand new Christians. You've been saved for a couple of weeks. You've been saved for a couple of months. You've been saved for less than a year, and so you're just really getting started in this whole journey of faith, and praise God for that. That is awesome. I know we've got some here in the room, and you've been Christians for years now. You've been living for Jesus. You've been trying to grow in your faith. And so the level of faith is all over here at United this morning. And I know that we got some people who are brand new. I know we got some people who aren't quite as new. And because of that, we've got some people here in this room that you've got some mountains and you want to see those mountains get moved. But you might be looking at yourself here this morning. And if you're being honest, when you consider where you're at in your heart, you're a little discouraged. You're a little convicted because you think to yourself, I think I've got a little faith, and I don't know. Sometimes I doubt. Sometimes I wonder, God, are you really able to do that? Look at Matthew chapter 17, because there's such good news. Look at what Jesus says in verse 20. He says in verse 20 to his disciples, the reason why you could not cast out the demon is because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So although Jesus is disappointed because of his disciples' little faith, it's not really that the issue is little faith. Really the issue is weak faith. And there's a big difference. 
And the reason why I know that that's the issue is because he says right here in verse 20, if you guys just had the faith of a grain of mustard seed, you could move mountains. And what do we know about mustard seeds? Go with me to Matthew chapter 13. Look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 31. Jesus is going to put another parable before his disciples, and he says this, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field, and it is the smallest of all the seeds. So was a mustard seed a big seed, or was it a little seed? It was the smallest of all the seeds. It was as small as you could possibly get a seed. And so what is the point that Jesus is saying? The point is little faith can grow. Even if you have little faith, like the grain of a mustard seed, you could look at mountains and you could say to them, move from here and they would go to there and nothing would be impossible for you. So the problem was not really little faith. The problem was weak faith. And that's a very important difference. Little faith is something that even a brand new baby Christian can have. You're just getting started in your faith, but you want to see God move some mountains, and so you still choose to believe that God is able. Weak faith is, and no matter where you're at in your faith, whether you're a brand new Christian or you've been a Christian now for years, you want to see God do some things, but when you consider God doing that, you know what you do? You waver in your faith. And you doubt. And I don't know the reason why. Maybe it's because you're looking at the mountain and it seems so big and you're wondering, how could God really do that? Maybe the reason why, and I think this might be the case for many people here in this room, is because as you consider what you want to see God do, you think about all the times in the past where you feel like you served the Lord and you went for it. You invited that friend to church. You went to share the gospel. And you stepped out in faith and it felt like nothing happened. And so because now you feel like you've done some things for God where it felt like God did not work in that moment, as you consider what you want to see God do in the future, you waver in your faith and you have weak faith because you're not continuing to trust in who God is and what he's able to do. Instead, you're looking at yourself. Go with me to Luke chapter 17. And let me give you a very practical step that you can take today to grow in your faith. Luke chapter 17. This is something that I want to encourage every single person here this morning to literally do today. Whether it's before you leave the service, you go up to somebody and you actually do this, or whether it's when you're at home, you text somebody, and this is a step that you could take. But look at Luke 17, verse 5. It says this, The apostles all come to the Lord together. And here's what they say, Increase our faith. And the Lord says in verse 6, If you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And so again, here Jesus is teaching his disciples about this idea of little faith and weak faith. And they're coming to him and they're saying, increase our faith. And Jesus brings up again this idea of the mustard seed. And he's talking about, hey, even little faith has so much potential because it can grow. And little faith isn't even about faith itself. It's about the one in whom the faith is placed. But what I specifically love about this passage right here is how the apostles all come together to the Lord asking for him to increase their faith. And this is discipline number three that you could write down on your handout. I want to encourage you here this morning to involve others. I want to encourage you here this morning that you need to involve others. You need to share with your brothers. You need to share with your sisters. You need to say things to people, whether it's here today or like I said, you go home and you text somebody, you call somebody, or you say this at your group on Thursday. Hey guys, I want to let you know, here's where I'm really at. These are the things that I want to see God do, and you share your heart, you share your prayer request list, you share your dreams, but then you follow it up with, and yeah, I also got to let you know, here are the areas where I'm struggling to believe that God is really able to do it. Here are the areas in my life where I can see that I've got little faith. Let me ask you, who knows where you're really at in your faith? Let me ask you, who knows what you want to see God do and the ways that you sometimes doubt are the moments that you have where sometimes your faith is weak. Go with me to Galatians chapter 6. Everybody, turn in your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 6 because I really do want to encourage you here today. I want to encourage you before you leave that our God is faithful. He will grow you. 
your faith will be strengthened. Wherever you are at in your faith as you sit here today, God will not leave you there. And at the same time, he's calling you to grow in your faith. And the biggest obstacle between you and growing into the faith that you want to have and that God is calling you to experience in your life, the biggest obstacle between where you are today and where you need to be, do you know what it is? The biggest obstacle is you. You giving up. You growing weary. You getting discouraged. You stopping. Look at what it says right here in Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. Galatians chapter 6, verse 8, it says, For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Here's a promise. Hey, are you doing some good? Are you working for the Lord? Are you evangelizing some people? Praying for God to save? serving him? Are there some things that you want to see God do? Do not give up. Do not grow weary. Why? Because the promise is, if you do not give up, in due season you will reap. And we don't know when the due season is. We don't know when that's going to come. But here's the promise from God. Do not grow weary. Because he is faithful. And he will work. Write this down for discipline number four here this morning. Trust the process. Man, I know. If you guys have been here at United, you've heard me share very openly and honest about my times of doubt and my days of discouragement. And so believe me when I say I know how disheartening it can be. Man, it can feel frustrating. You want to see God work. And even you look at your own life and you want to see yourself grow. And you're like, why am I doubting? I should believe. I do believe. Why is there still this weak faith sometimes? and you want to grow, and you want it now, and you're wondering, why is this not happening? I was so encouraged this past week in a book that I was reading about Christmas by a guy named Sinclair Ferguson with this quote. I wanted to share it with you guys. Sinclair Ferguson said, God may seem slow, but he is always on time. He has never been late. Now, what an awesome perspective to have. Trust the process. Go with me to one last passage here this morning, Mark chapter 9. Everybody turn with me to one last passage, Mark chapter 9, because I want to show you Mark's version of our story, because he includes details that Matthew doesn't. Matthew's version, what we're studying here today, it's very straightforward. And the reason why is because his emphasis is clear. He's emphasizing faith. And we're going to talk even more about that on Thursday night at small groups. I'm saving part of my message for then, so you're going to have to come back for part two. But I want you to look with me for just a second at verse 21 and see what Mark says. Mark 9, verse 21. Here comes Jesus to this father, and he asks him a question. How long has this been happening to your son, to your boy? And the father said something so sad from childhood. And the demon has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, please have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And this poor boy in this story that we're studying here this morning, he's been suffering since childhood. And we don't know how old he is in this story that we're studying here today, but he's possessed by a demon. He's having seizures. This demon is throwing him into fire and into water, trying to destroy him. And I want you for just a minute to try to think about this from the father's perspective, from his dad's view. Can you imagine how hard his life must be? I mean, if, if his son is possessed by a demon and the demon is throwing him often into fire and water trying to kill him, this dad can literally never leave his boy alone. This dad has to constantly supervise his boy because it could just be a second of looking in the wrong direction and the demon takes control and throws him into fire and there goes your boy. And so we don't know how long this time has been, but if you think about it from the father's perspective, then can you imagine how tired he must be? Especially if you're a dad, because there's no expense that you would spare if your boy's going through something that you would not do to get him help. You'd go the extra mile. You'd spend the extra dollar. And so he must have done everything. 
He must be at his wit's end. And here he is feeling helpless and hopeless, and then he hears about this guy named Jesus and his disciples who have the power to heal people, and so he goes to them, and the disciples could not do it. And he's thinking, oh man, this was my last chance. This was my last hope. And then here comes Jesus with Peter, James, and John coming down the mountain, and he's like, but wait, there he is. And so he goes to Jesus, and he asks for mercy, and then he says, please, just if you can heal him, have compassion on us and help us. And you understand where he's coming from. And then you hear what Jesus says with such helpful clarity. He says, if you can, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. So Jesus is teaching us here this morning, don't think if you can't thoughts about God. And one of the reasons why people might think if you can't thoughts about God is because of all of the things that they've already done to try to move the mountain. And so now here they come to God, and they're like, God, if you can do it, you hear people talk like this. I guess all we can do now is just pray about it. Like as if that's our last resort. Like as if that's our last option. Like as if that's our Hail Mary when the clock is down to five seconds and it's fourth and 20 and we need six more points. Like, okay, well, I guess uh, if you can, God, like you, you've got to do it. And Jesus says, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. And this father who's just having this real moment where he's believing, but he's struggling. He just said, like he just outbursts. He just cries out, I believe, <laughs> but please help my unbelief. Like, I believe you can. But honestly, there's a part of me where I'm still, I'm struggling and I'm doubting. And I think this is such a helpful picture. And the reason why I think this is such a helpful picture is because this is real. This is where most of us here in this room, if we're being honest, we find ourselves on a Tuesday at lunch when we're at school and all we've heard all day long are cuss words, all we've heard all day long are people in sin, all we've heard all day long are people disrespecting their teachers and we're thinking to ourselves, God, I want to see you revive, I want to see you save, but then you're thinking back on every class and all of the discouragement, all of the sin, all of the disappointment and all of these doubts are starting to rise up in your heart and you're like, I believe but ah here's discipline number five honestly pray for help honestly pray for help i want to encourage you here this morning to be real with god in prayer ask him to grow you in faith because he will and see the reason why we should be real with god is because he can see your heart if you're pretending you're fooling no one he knows you better than you know yourself. And so be real with him. Ask him to grow you, and he will. If you want to grow in your faith, here are five disciplines for you that I would encourage you to begin practicing here today. Focus on truth, apply what you know, involve others, trust the process, and honestly pray for help. That is how you can grow in faith. Those are the five disciplines that I would encourage you guys with here this morning to begin doing every single day that would help you grow in your faith so that way you would be able to say to mountains, move from here to there, and nothing would be impossible for you. You guys do uh, Advent calendars? Anybody do Advent calendars at their house? We do an Advent calendar in my house. This was a tradition that I would do growing up in my family where you'd go to Trader Joe's and you get the chocolate calendar. We've got three of these at my house. My kids are all so excited about it. We just bust the chocolates out right after breakfast because we're that excited. But see, the idea is real simple. It's just a countdown to Christmas, right? That's the whole idea about Advent is you're counting the days looking forward to Christmas when Jesus is, is coming. And so we do this Advent calendar. It's just a, it's a fun way in our house to get excited and get pumped up about Christmas. I've got an Advent challenge for us here at United. An Advent challenge that I want every single one of us to do beginning here today. And I've got no calendars and I've got no chocolates to give you. But here's my Advent challenge. I want us to do our own countdown to Christmas. And what I want us to do is each day, there's 22 days until Christmas, each day I want you to pray that we would see Jesus save people this Christmas. 
Because that's what Christmas is all about. Jesus came as a Savior. And so I can't think about anything better that would honor Jesus than seeing him do what he came to do this Christmas season. And so I want to challenge you. The United Advent Challenge is each day, all of United, on our own, let's pray that Jesus would save. And you've got 22 days left. Go home, pray that this Christmas we would see Jesus save. Wake up tomorrow, pray that this Christmas we would see Jesus save. And every single day, as we get closer, you know what's going to happen? There's going to be this growing anticipation. Lord, when are you going to do it? And if you're struggling to believe that God's going to do it, focus on the truth. Apply what you know. Involve others. Trust the process. And honestly, pray for help. Let me pray that we will.